Hey everyone, my name is Colin and I am currently a second year graduate student um, in the MD, PhD, MD PhD program here at UAV. And over the past year, I've had the opportunity to serve as one of the co-chairs for the independent student analysis for the LCME reaccreditation process here at our school. Today, I'm extremely fortunate to be joined by Dr. Lovell and Dr. Byerly. Dr. Lovell has co-chaired the UGRC and Dr. Byerly has led a working group for the UGRC and both represent um, the graduate medical education and UMA. Um, so Dr. Lovell, Dr. Byerly, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you, Colin. So I'm going to be totally honest. I actually hadn't learned too much about the UGRC coalition and what recommendations you guys were working on and the report that you developed. So if you wouldn't mind, could you elaborate a little bit more and explain how this came about? Sure, I, I could probably take that. Uh, just give you a little bit of background because I think you're right. A lot of people haven't even heard of the coalition. So, you know, the Coalition for Physician Accountability is a collaboration of national organizations and they're responsible for the oversight and education and assessment really of medical students and physicians throughout their medical careers. And the UGRC is basically the UME GME Review Committee. And this was um, uh, basically uh, uh, put forth by the coalition to try to solve some of the problems with the UME GME transition. And it actually springs back to the um, to INCAS, which was the Invitational Conference on USMLE scoring. I think I've seen prior um, information coming out, um, you know, from your uh, institution about, you know, that idea that with uh, USMLE going from, uh, you know, a numeric score to pass fail, there's going to be a lot of consequences to that. And INCAS is where that came from. But INCAS also had another recommendation, which was to more comprehensively uh, really reform the UME GME transition. And that's where, you know, really the UGRC came from. And we've been working over the past year now as a committee of 30 people, and it's really representation from across the, the medical education spectrum. So it includes medical students, residents, you know, folks from UME like Julie, folks from GME like myself, I'm, I'm actually a program director in emergency medicine, and also organizational representatives from some of the actual organizations in the, uh, in the, in the coalition. And it was a big process, and I'd refer you back to the website, which is basically the physician for physician for um, sorry for the Coalition for Physician Accountability's uh, website, which has a huge amount of information on background. But basically, it'll take you through the process that we went through, which was um, looking forward to the future and saying, "Hey, what would this uh, you know future ideal state look like if the transition actually worked?" And then also looking at some of the real root causes of the current problems in the transition. And then finally, this process of brainstorming that we went through with a lot of extra help from uh, stakeholders out you know in the community to actually come up with the 34 final recommendations. So that's a very big overview of of sort of where we came from. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And thank you for explaining all that. And it's, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, that is definitely a constant conversation amongst medical students right now is considering with, you know, step one, especially going past fail and changes that are occurring within ERES and the residency transition process or is a primary focus for medical students. And so I was looking through some of the recommendations and uh, I saw one that kind of caught my eye, which was recommendation 11. And under that theme, it talked about um, outcome framework and assessment process and how schools should be using different um, processes to essentially assess student competency before they make that transition. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that recommendation? Sure, I can take that one. Um, so we all recognize that there is so much in the way of um, skills and competencies expected for physicians to perform well um, in residency. And um, previously, there's been an unfortunate disconnect between what makes for a good medical student and what makes for a good resident. And so one of the things that we hope that this reevaluation of the continuum um, accomplishes is to get the educators on the medical school side speaking the same language and using the same descriptors as the educators on the residency side. And we would like for those evaluations to be broad, um, not just based on medical knowledge, test taking, that kind of thing, not just based on 
clinical skills, but also incorporating um, the communication skills, the practice-based learning, that kind of thing that is important to uh, physician performance in the end. So we're really hoping that new assessment tools will be developed that UME and GME educators can both become familiar with. And then UME educators and GME educators can speak the, the same language as we think about the learner progression across the continuum. Gotcha. That's, all, that's awesome to hear because you're right. There's a lot of components. I think students tend to focus on maybe one of them, but all of them really ultimately are going to tie together to make you the best resident possible. So if we're able to set that early on during UME and know what we're looking for, I think that'll be great right. for the transition. And part of this is, is about competencies. I mean, we want every graduate of medical school to be competent as a physician, and we want the residency training programs to trust and understand what that competence actually means. And so using that same sort of language around competency is, is a piece of this that's very important. Absolutely. And now is that going to also tie into, I think it was recommendation 14 and 15 that look into a little bit of these letters of recommendation, as well as the MSP. Does that recommendation tie into there too? Yeah, absolutely. So the concept is that, you know, when you think about the transition, uh, you know, again, I think there's a lot of focus on just like applying and matching, right? But, but no, the transition is so much more, right? It's this huge interconnected complex, uh, you know, sort of path that learners take. And um, so, yeah, a lot of our recommendations reflect that interconnectedness and complexity. So, um, you know, you're absolutely right. If you think about, um, you know, recommendation 11 um, being sort of the a lead into recommendation 14, which is about um, basically improving the medical student performance evaluation or MISB, um, it makes sense that some of the issues with the MISB right now are that there is a lack of, um, you know, sort of great assessments out there. There's a lack of that common language around competency, um, especially some of, again, the sort of, I don't know, disregarded competencies that are harder to, to assess competencies, things like professionalism. And so if you want to create a document that is going to be trusted between medical student schools and um, programs, and the program director is going to be able to look at this and say, oh, okay, this really is a reflection of who the student is. It's their strengths. You know, it's all of their uh, characteristics. And um, you know, you know, there, it's a it's a it's a true reflection of of this person, and and you know, this is you know, this is something we can actually rely on. Um, the MISB has a ways to go as far as as far as improvements, and that's what that recommendation fourteen is. And recommendation fifteen uh, then is sort of it's tied to that too, because it's the recommendation that asks that instead of having these long narrative letters of recommendation, that instead we move to a system where we use structured uh, letters of evaluation. And it's that concept that instead of just having, again, um, you know, a lot of uh, superlatives, uh, you know, talking about a student, but not really necessarily being able to um, distinguish students one from another, because a lot of these letters end up somewhat reading the same, um, to have it be more objective, have it be really based on direct observation, have it be based on competencies, uh, and have it be specialty specific. But really, I think the key thing is it is much more of a letter of you know, evaluation rather than a letter of recommendation. And that's a big switch. And that's going to be a different sort of mindset for both, I think, learners as well as evaluators, folks in schools. Um, and also then it's information that hopefully will be more useful to programs. And it actually exists in some specialties already. Emergency medicine uses that and um, internal medicine has been um, working with a structured letter and so has um, actually OB uh, guides. So, so the, the, the roots are out there right now, but the goal, the recommendation is to make it more universal across specialties. And all those recommendations, um, well, actually all of um, what the, UGRC tried to do was to improve the equity and the transparency, the fairness across the continuum, and really, you know, to work toward the public good, which is a lot about um, providing health care and creating the workforce of physicians in our, our, our country. And um, so the, if implemented correctly, these recommendations 11, 14, and 15 will all improve equity and um, eliminate some of the bias that is, is currently an inherent part of the process of transitioning from med school to residency. Absolutely. Yeah, that's terrific to hear. Now, I am I am certainly a couple years away from applying to residency, but when do you guys expect that 
these recommendations will start taking place. I mean, it sounds like for recommendation 15, some are already kind of working towards this, but what is like your goal for when we could hopefully see these transitions being made? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated answer because of course there is no like one group or one organization that's in charge of the transition. That's part of why we are where we are is because, you know, if, if you use sort of like a, a house analogy, the transition is this giant sort of house that's been added to over the years and, uh, you know, there's been additions and, uh, you know, it's very uh, interconnected and, uh, you know, it's a giant place, but there's no general contractor. There's no one who actually has oversight uh, for the transition. And so, you know, you end up with um, different organizations that potentially have different interests. And, you know, now we have to come together and collaborate and work together. So how do we move forward? Um, again, some uh, of these recommendations are already being, uh, you know, worked on proposed, as, as you say, especially things like the structure of evaluative letters. Um, also, for example, on um, the recommendation about having this year's interview season be virtual again, you know, that's a recommendation um, that came out of, um, you know, one of our final recommendations as well. Um, but what we're hoping is that that different organizations will self-identify and collaborate to move these different recommendations forward. And depending on where the sort of base research is and the base understanding of the problem is, I think that will um, in, in basically impact how quickly a, a solution can be moved forward. So. You know, there's 34 recommendations. It's not going to all happen at once. Again, if you look at the, the website, um, there is a, a proposed timeline for the implementation of the recommendations. And, you know, you'll see that some of them are, are relatively straightforward and could probably move pretty fast. Other ones will take a lot of work, you know, things like developing competencies. Uh, our competency language and you know competency-based assessments that everyone can agree on that's that's going to be a bigger lift and so that's going to be you know more over the next few years i think from a time frame but julie what do you think yeah um and one of the things that is uh such an asset from the coalition for physician accountability managing this process is that its goal is public good and um caring for the population um we are dependent on the um, institutions that have authority over the process in different ways to embrace these recommendations and, and carry out the changes necessary to implement these recommendations. Uh, but I believe there was uniform acceptance from the 30 people that really dove into this over the last year or so that um, the transition would be much uh, more successfully accomplished on all sides if these recommendations could be implemented and fully adopted. For sure. And, you know, buy-in in these situations and culture changes everything. And it doesn't necessarily happen overnight, but it's certainly exciting to see that, you know, we're taking those first steps in the right direction. Um, well, I know we're running short on time here and I know you two are both very busy individuals. So thank you so much for taking some time out of your schedules to talk with me a little bit more about this. And I'm very excited to see where the UGRC and the recommendations take us next. Thank you, Colin. Good luck. Thank, thank you. you.